good morning to everyone. It is certainly good to be here and to see everybody. We're very thankful for everyone's presence. This morning, as you can see, I want to talk for a little while about the subject of our words and the Christian speech. I think this is an important topic. Back throughout Scripture, the Christian speech and how we use speech is something that's addressed many times. Now, when it comes to the tongue or sins of the tongue, there are many different types of things that we need to be aware of. There's different ways that we can sin with our speech. But I want to focus on one area in particular this morning. But to start, I'd like to read the words of Jesus in Matthew 15 and verse 11. Jesus says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Now Jesus was speaking here and correcting some ideas about some of the ceremonial ideas that the people of that day had and what defiled or didn't defile. And Jesus used it as an opportunity to teach that really what someone was eating was not what defiled a person, but the things that came out of the mouth. Now we've all heard that phrase, you are what you eat, but Jesus makes it more, you are what you say. It's more about what comes out of our mouth. And the truth is, our speech says something about us. Every one of us communicates with other people on a daily basis, and the way that we communicate tells those people something about us, including the very words that we speak, the words that we choose to use to communicate our ideas and our thoughts and our feelings to others, can either mark us as pure children of God or as defiled and worldly. And there are many forms of defiling speech. In fact, in Matthew 15, Jesus specifically would go on to condemn false witness and slander. But there are many other forms of defiling speech that we see in the New Testament, including lying and gossip and so much more. But for this lesson, I want to consider the topic of cursing and profanity. Now, I'm assuming that most of the people in this audience, if not all, would probably agree that profanity is not something that is good and wholesome and upright. And yet, it is something that there are debates about from time to time. There's Christians or people that claim to be Christians that try and defend using profanity or hearing profanity. Or more common are ways that we get around profanity, so to speak, and find other ways of expressing surprise or displeasure or anger with words that may not be condemned by society but convey the same idea. And so for a little while this morning, I want to consider what the Bible has to say about the topic of profanity. Now, we might begin with the question, what is profanity? When we talk about profanity, what is it that we mean? Well, generally speaking, when we refer to profanity, we mean words that are also called curse words or cuss words or obscenities or something along that line in our modern day vernacular. But it's also clear that uh, this word has something else in mind. In fact, it's pretty clear that the word profanity is related to the word profane. Now, when we talk about profanity in general, and we'll do that in a little while, we recognize we're not always talking about something that is profane. Society recognizes profanity as just anything that's vulgar or uncouth or inappropriate. They're words that society doesn't want children hearing or saying. They're words that are unacceptable in professional environments or educational environments. It's a speech with a high form or high likelihood of offending others. These are, it's the type of language that earns movies and shows and video games or books mature warnings and ratings to warn the audience that there's language that could be offensive. But at the basis, at the foundation of what profanity is, and that's where I want to begin, is the idea of something that is profane. Now the word profanity in Merriam-Webster's College Dictionary, it says that profanity is the quality or state of being profane or the use of profane language. Now that doesn't really help us much unless we know what profane means. And something that is profane is something that is not concerned with religion or religious purposes. In other words, something that is secular or not holy because unconsecrated, impure, or defiled, or serving to debase or defile what is holy. In other words, irreverent, obscene, and vulgar. And that third definition is more in line with what we mean when we talk about language or behavior that is profane. It is something 
that desecrates or debases or defiles something else that is supposed to be holy, something that is supposed to be sacred. Now, the Bible addresses the act of profaning, especially in the Old Testament, and profaning goes beyond just speech. For example, the altar could be profaned according to Exodus 20 and verse 25. The Sabbath could be profaned. Offering child sacrifices to Moloch was said to profane the name of your God in Leviticus 18 and 21. Swearing falsely was said to profane the name of God. Stealing was said to profane the name of God. So something is profane when it either makes something that is supposed to be sacred to be common or when it violates God's law. So working on the Sabbath made it like a typical day. God had said there's six days in which you are supposed to work and you can do your work, but the seventh day is a holy day. It is a special day. It is set aside for holy purposes. And so when someone worked on the Sabbath, what did they do? They made a day that was supposed to be holy, just like all the other days. And thus they profaned the Sabbath. They made something that was supposed to be holy and sacred something that was common. Evil actions such as child sacrifice and lying and stealing, those are a direct affront to God's holiness. And so when God's children do such things, they profane the name of the, name of the Lord instead of glorifying it. So when we apply those ideas and those principles to speech, it makes profane speech is that which makes holy things common or speech that violates God's law. So in a sense, all speech that is sinful speech is profane. But in a specific sense, profane speech is what you might call blasphemous speech. For example, when someone uses the name of God as nothing more than a common exclamation of surprise, when someone gets angry and thus they yell out the name of their Lord, they are using the holy name of our most holy God and our Savior and a debased ordinary common way. And that is profane. That is profaning something that is holy and it should not be done by God's people. But as we consider profanity and beyond this, we also need to consider the nature of language and words. A words, after all, is not, is nothing. a word is nothing more than a combination of letters in written form or of sounds in verbal form. And such a combination in and of itself is morally neutral. There's nothing righteous about the letter R. There's nothing unholy about the letter U. They're just letters. They're just sounds. And when you put them together, they make a set of sounds or they make a set of symbols on a page. And in a sense, there is nothing right or wrong about those things. Now, because of this, some people have tried to argue that there really is nothing wrong with profanity. After all, a word is just a word. But it's not the combination of sounds or the combination of symbols that makes something wrong, but it is the fact that words have meanings and words convey ideas. And the letters and sounds help us communicate those ideas and understand those meanings. For example, the letters D, G, and O are both used to make the word God or dog. But those two words have very different meanings. And we look at them and understand them in very different ways. And so while letters and sounds may not be good or bad, ideas and meanings absolutely can be. Some meanings are positive and uplifting and holy. Others are wicked and sensual and sinful. And when profanity is condemned, it is because the purpose and the meaning behind the word or the phrase is evil. Now, one thing that's interesting is profanity, or cussing as we might think of it, is not really directly addressed in the Bible. Now, there is not a passage I can take you to to give you a list of forbidden words that you should avoid. And there couldn't be. Because again, with the nature of language, language changes over time. You know, there are words um, just a century ago that were innocent words, and meant nothing bad, but now in today's society means something very different. Or there may be words that a hundred years ago people would not say, but culturally today they really mean something different and they are acceptable. And so a book could not, like the Bible could not be written that conveys and lists every word that could ever be prohibited because words change in meaning over time. Not only that, but there's a vast difference in languages. There's a difference in English and Portuguese and Spanish and Russian. 
there's differences in these languages. And even in contemporary language, some words may be bad in one context, yet acceptable in another. Cultural influences impact language. I read a story of a man who was over in the UK and speaking to a group of religious people, and he talked about Uh, He was giving an illustration of a war and a battle, and he described it as a bloody battle. Now, over here, we understand that as something gruesome, as violent, as a battle in which there was a great deal of shed blood. But in the United Kingdom and in that area, bloody is a word that is often used, and it truly is a curse word. It's a blasphemous word in the way that's meant. If you look up the etymology, it's a word that the idea is used in reference to to the blood of the cross. It's a way of swearing. And so it offended his gr- this group of people when he spoke because they thought he was using it in that sense. There's a big difference between even English in different cultures. And so again, we can't just come up with a list of forbidden words. But that doesn't mean we have no guidance. The Bible provides us principles that can help us know what is appropriate and what is not appropriate when it comes to our speech. But how can we know? How can we know if the words that we use and the phrases we utter are acceptable or not? Well, first of all, as we've already mentioned, if something goes against God's law, it is profane and it is simple. Therefore, any words or phrases that convey irreverent ideas are sinful. Are sinful. I think we understand this in a basic way. Like I've already mentioned, I think most of us would agree that using the name of the Lord as a way of exclaiming surprise or as a way of... Uh, showing our anger, taking the name of the Lord in vain, we probably all agree, I hope we all agree, that that's wrong. It's trivializing something that is supposed to be holy and revered. And such words and phrases profane holy things and shouldn't be avoided by God's people. Again, I think most of us understand this. But I think there are some other ways that we can make holy things common. Another fairly obvious example could be that of hell and damnation. Scripture reveals that hell is a very real place. It is a place that has been prepared and is prepared by God for the punishment of evildoers, most notably Satan and his angels, according to Matthew 25. And this eternal punishment is called condemnation or damnation. But you know, the destruction of the wicked is not something that brings God joy. You can reference Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33. It brings God no pleasure or happiness to know that He will have to punish evildoers for all eternity if they do not repent. It brings Him no joy that there will be people that spend eternity in hell. And it should not be something that you and I take lightly. And yet, people use both the name of hell... And the idea of damnation is common words to explain, uh, exclaim displeasure over everyday trivial things. And worse still, some people use these words and ideas to insult others or to, in a sense, curse others. Now, I don't think most people in modern society are looking to actual curse or put a curse or a hex upon somebody. But that is the idea of some of this language. That's why it's called cursing. Or curse words. They are words and phrases that are meant to pronounce or wish a curse upon somebody. Now, the desire to offend somebody and the desire to curse somebody is a problem in and of itself. But then to add the sin of improper language just compounds the issue. And cursing is not something that should come from a Christian's lips. Now, there is a right and a proper way to talk about cursing and being cursed. For example, in Galatians 3 and 10, Paul said, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. There is a right way to talk about a sense of being cursed. If we disobey God, if we refuse to repent and rebel, then we are under the curse of sin. And if we continue under the curse of sin and we do not seek repentance, if we do not seek to be made right with the Lord by obeying the gospel, then we will be cursed, we will be damned for all eternity. But to trivially and nonchalantly utter angry curses is sinful. James 3 verse 8 through 10 says, No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. For the same, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. When James says these things ought not to be, 
that is an inspired prohibition of cursing others. To tell someone to go to hell, to speak of damnation of someone as a wish because you're angry or you want to vent your frustration is sinful. And we ought not to say those things. It doesn't matter how frustrated we are. It doesn't matter how annoying they are. It doesn't matter how much they've harmed us or hurt us. To wish those things upon someone, even if you don't actually wish them, it's just you expressing your anger. The Bible says that ought not to be. We're hypocrites if we come to church on Sunday and sing praises through our mouths to God and then use our mouths to utter curses upon our fellow man as soon as we leave. But I want to take this another step further. Again, I think most of us here, probably all of us, probably agree with what I've said so far. We should not take the Lord's name in vain. We shouldn't curse others. But I want to just consider this idea, and you could probably make a lot of application. I'm just going to focus on one idea of this idea of making holy things common. For example, and some of these things may seem innocent, but I frequently hear or read or see jokes about hell and heaven. I've seen a lot of cartoons over the years that make fun of hell in various ways, and I've heard lots of people tell jokes about heaven. Cartoons and shows and jokes that get told about these places of eternity abound. But I want you to think about this, and I'm not trying to make laws where the Bible does not make laws. But hell and eternal separation from God is not a laughing matter. It's not something to joke about. It's a real place. There are people, like the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, who are currently suffering and will do so for all eternity. That's not something to laugh about. It's not something to joke about. Hell is the vindication of God's holiness and righteousness against those who oppose Him and are His enemies. That's not something to make light of. Should we be comfortable trivializing and joking about something so precious and so sacred as the home of God's children? Again, I hear jokes and they sound innocent. In fact, sometimes we think they're the good jokes because they're clean jokes. But do you think we should trivially talk about heaven? Do you think that we should call secular earthly things and feelings and experiences heaven on earth? Do you think that we should make jokes, make uh, the eternal reward of the saints the butt of common jokes? Again, I'm not trying to make rules. I don't have a list of which jokes you can and cannot tell. I just want to encourage us to be mindful to be thoughtful and wise and sober-minded before making light of eternal reward or eternal punishment. After all, especially in the case of heaven, if we make the home of the saints the butt of jokes, is that not the very definition of making something that is sacred to be common and thus profane? And so when it comes to profane speech, We simply need to understand the principles. We can't come up with a list of jokes to tell or not tell, of words to say or not say. Instead, Scripture guides us by principles. And that that we've seen is to not make sacred things common and not to curse. We would do well to evaluate our speech. And if we can identify words we use, jokes we tell, or things we talk about which profane holy concepts, then we need to change. But as I mentioned earlier, When we refer to profanity in our current culture, we are not only referring to words that profane in a technical sense or curse. Some words and phrases have nothing to do with holy things or spiritual things, and yet they are still considered profanity. For example, when the Classification and Ratings Administration gives a movie a PG-13 or an R rating for language, it has nothing to do with that movie profaning sacred ideas or cursing people. It simply means that the film uses what we commonly call cuss words, language that society recognizes as vulgar and inappropriate for younger audiences. But is such language condemned in Scripture? As long as something doesn't profane or blaspheme or curse, then is it really all that bad? Some would argue that cuss words might be culturally unacceptable, but they're not sinful. Again, the Bible doesn't 
and can't give a list of cuss words and that are inappropriate. And since language is fluid and it is based on culture, some people argue that words are just that. They're just words. And thus they are not sinful. Again, as long as they don't blaspheme or profane or curse. Well, again, the Bible may not address specific words, but it does provide us with more than enough guidance and instruction concerning our speech. And an honest look at Scripture, I believe, will show us that common profanity is something that Christians should avoid. And there's three passages that I want to spend the rest of our time looking at to demonstrate why Christians should avoid all forms of profanity. First of all, there's Ephesians 4 verse 29. Now if you back up and look at verses 17 through 24, the Apostle Paul there is explaining that Christians are to live a new life. After obeying the gospel, Christians should not continue to walk as the Gentiles do. There's a way that the world behaves. There's a way the world dresses. There's things that entertain the world. There's a way the world speaks. And when we obey the gospel, and the blood of Jesus Christ washes our sins away, and we are buried with Him in baptism, and we rise to newness of life, and we become a new creature in Christ, then we need to begin living a new life. The things we do, the way we act, the way we dress and show ourselves, the way we speak, those things need to change. And so Paul in verses 25 through 32 gives us some examples of what that newness looks like. How it is that in our new self we resemble the righteousness and the holiness of God. It says that there it looks like speaking the truth and controlling our anger and working honestly instead of stealing. And then in verse 29 Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Paul says, Let no corrupting talk Come out of your mouth. Now that word corrupting talk is translated from a Greek word that appears seven other times in Scripture. And all of those other times that it appears, it is used to describe bad or diseased fruit. It's a word that means rotten or putrid of a bad quality. According to one lexicon, it's described as pertaining to that which is harmful in view of its being unwholesome and corrupting. When words or phrases are recognized as vulgar, fifth, filthy words, then Christians do not need to use them. And let's be honest, we don't need an official list of what those words are to know whether or not they are appropriate. When Hollywood, when our secular society and other secular organizations recognize that words are unwholesome and corrupting, surely we as the Lord's people can recognize that those words are inappropriate. If Hollywood won't allow their movies to say certain words because those will be viewed by children, why would we use those words? How can we have a lower, how could we have a lower standard than our immoral society? What we say is made up of the words that we use. And what we say, including the words that we use, should benefit others. And it should build them up. Profanity does not benefit other people. Maybe we think it adds color to, a, to our language or to our speech. But it doesn't do so in a positive way. It doesn't build others up. It doesn't help them. On the other hand, it very well can have a corrupting or an unwholesome influence. Again, that's why children's movies and children's shows are not allowed to have these types of words in them because it's recognized that will corrupt young minds. Now, why it's okay to corrupt adult minds but not young minds, I've never figured out. And why we're okay with that, I don't know. But we shouldn't use these words. And if a child, if we wouldn't want a child repeating the words we say, then we probably shouldn't use those words. Now just a few verses later, Paul comes back to the use of improper speech. In Ephesians 5 verse 2, he encourages the Christians to walk in love. But Paul also clears up the common mis worldly misconception of what love is not. He points out there's a significant difference between love and lust. Christians are to walk in love, 
And that means that sexual immorality and all impurity should not even be named among God's people in Ephesians 5 verse 3. But then he expounds on the idea of all impurity in verse 4 where he says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. So when Paul talks about impurity, he condemns both impure action, that's what that word filthiness refers to as action, but also impure speech that he describes as foolish talk and crude joking. Now that word translated in the ESV as crude joking, I think coarse jesting is the way it is in the New King James or the King James, but it's used only here in the New Testament, but it means coarse jesting involving vulgar expressions and indecent content. This verse condemns the likes of dirty jokes, vulgar speech, and words or phrases that are sexually explicit. And a great deal of profanity is one of those things. Vulgar, sexually explicit, or dirty in some form or another. And that type of speech should not come from the lips of God's people. What conversation that we have with one another or with our neighbors is going to build up and benefit and impart grace to the hearers by including words or phrases that are vulgar, explicit, and filthy. Obviously there is none. But also in Colossians 3 verse 8, in, a, in Colossians 3, this is a parallel passage to Ephesians 4. And Paul's making much the same point that he did in Ephesians 4. Namely, that Christians are to live, live a different type of life. The way he explains it in Colossians is they are to set their minds on things above. Now to do this, there are many things that Christians are going to have to put to death. That's not people. That's actions in their own life. And that's some very strong language. As I mentioned uh, in Ephesians, Paul talks about you don't walk as the Gentiles walk any longer. In Colossians, Paul makes it pretty explicit. There were ways you used to behave and live and speak and things you used to do. And that stuff needs to be put away so thoroughly, it's as if you're killing those things. You are putting to death the way you used to behave. You're not just kind of becoming a little bit of a better person. You're not just not doing those things as much. You're stopping it as if you had killed it. And then he goes on and he talks about things that the Christians must put away. These things such as immorality, slander, and covetousness, and anger. These are things that are common in the world, but they have no part in a Christian's life. And among that list that is to be put away is obscene talk. Now the Greek word there that is translated as obscene talk means speech of a kind that is generally considered in poor taste, obscene speech, or dirty talk. It's interestingly very closely related. If you remember what I mentioned in Ephesians and that word filthiness, I said that's improper action. Well, this word obscene talk is very closely related to that same word. And that word means behavior that flouts social and moral standards. We can philosophize all we want to about words being just words. But even our secular society, as loose and immoral as it usually is, has standards of speech and recognizes that there are words and phrases that are not appropriate. And when we flout even those cultural standards because we think we have some spiritual understanding that a word is just a word, we're sinning. When the world recognizes words and phrases are not good, we shouldn't use them. Again, if a child shouldn't use or hear a word, why should we use those words? If you wouldn't use a word in a professional environment, in front of your boss or your manager, at some interview, in a classroom, because that word or phrase would be viewed as crass or inappropriate, what makes that word okay in a casual setting? It's not justified just because it's a different setting. If it's improper, it's improper. Now another word for profanity or cuss word is obscenities. Well, anything that might be classified as obscene is strictly condemned in Colossians 3 verse 8. Now there's a final aspect of profanity that I want to discuss very briefly. I think most of us can agree there are several words and phrases 
that no Christian should use. And I don't have to print them or talk about them for us to know what they are. But there are other words and euphemisms and phrases that aren't so clear. General questions that people ask about, is this okay to say or not okay to say? For example, many people will not take the Lord's name in vain, but may use some similar sounding word instead. Some people are very against this. Some people are okay with this. Some words are less obscene than cuss words, but they function in essentially the same or at least a similar way. So where do we draw the line? I'll be honest. I do not believe that I or any of us can establish an exhaustive list of every possible word or every possible phrase that should not be uttered. But what I really want you to take and for me to take from this lesson and this study is that we need to apply the principles of Scripture so that we can make wise decisions. Because when it comes to our speech, we need to recognize that it reveals two key things about us. Our speech reveals our purity or impurity of the heart and it displays our self-control or the lack thereof. Just because we don't use certain words does not mean that we are pure of heart. We can be guilty of obscene talk and coarse jesting and unwholesome speech even through acceptable words. There are words that we shouldn't use. But more importantly, there are ideas and innuendos that we should not communicate in any form. And when it comes to our speech and the words that we say, our best option is that of self-control. We recognize that shouting out the name of the Lord when we're angry is not right. And thus some people find softer euphemisms. But here's a thought, and by the way, this is one that I'm working on. And I think all of us probably have to in some way. Instead of finding acceptable words and phrases to exclaim our displeasure or to cry out an alarm, why not learn self-control? I remember growing up, um, I had a family member that said shoot all the time. I never understood why. It was just a phrase that he used. Very good man. Very righteous man. It was just what he said when he got surprised. How many of us say, oh my goodness, so quickly? Now, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that you're sinning by saying that. That's one I've said a lot of times. But after studying this, I've thought, why do I say that? Why, when I'm surprised, do I have to say something? Why do I have to utter an exclamation because I'm angry? Why do I have to verbalize these things? And a lot of times it's because I just don't practice self-control. I've practiced enough self-control that I'm not going to blurt out some word that's highly offensive. But I'll still blurt out something just to blurt out something. And that worries me. Because Jesus says in Matthew 12 verse 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Not every cuss word they speak. Not every obscenity they speak, but every careless word they speak. So instead of training ourselves to utter acceptable exclamations of surprise or anger or the like, why don't we work at simply controlling our tongue? Instead of uttering anything carelessly, let us discipline ourselves to always think before we speak. You know, if we'll do that, We won't have to worry about whether some word or phrase has crossed the line into the profane and the obscene. That will never be a question because we will speak in a wholesome way. Communication is a great blessing and it is extremely important. Our speech can and it should be used for good. When you think about it, through our speech, we share the gospel. What a blessing that is. What a benefit that is. Through our speech and the use of words and song, we praise God. Through the use of speech, we encourage one another. We defend the truth. We offer thanks to God and to men and so much more. But our speech can also be a deadly and a destructive force. There are many ways that we can abuse the gift of speech. And one of those ways is the way that we've studied this morning. The way of profanity. When we use words that profane or blaspheme, we reveal an unholy and an unsanctified heart. 
When we curse, we display a lack of love and a gross misunderstanding of the terror of damnation. When we use obscene words and phrases, we demonstrate we have not been transformed and renewed in the likeness of Christ. Unfortunately, profanity is one of those things that is rampant in our culture. But it should not be rampant or even in existence in the church. So let us use our words wisely and use our speech in the wholesome way that Christ calls us to. Remember Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Be thoughtful about your speech and about the words that you use and use speech that discerns the situation and speaks appropriately. Speak in such a way that you impart grace to those who listen to you. That can go far beyond just profanity. But in all the ways that we speak, remember today, tomorrow, at work, at school, and family, wherever it might be, do your best to train yourself to speak in a way that imparts grace to your hearers. As we draw the lesson to a close, I hope that the study that I've brought before your attention this morning has given you some things to think about. I don't give this lesson because I just hear a whole lot of profanity among the members here. But it is a topic that maybe we take for granted. I was asked to write an article about this topic is why I studied it and realized I needed to think about it more and study it more. And so I hope I've shed some light on Bible principles that help us think more soberly about the way that we talk and the way that we speak and the way that we can impart grace to those that listen unto us. But as we draw the sermon to a close, we want to extend an invitation. Perhaps there's somebody here that is not a Christian who's living as the Gentiles do, who's living in the world lost in sin. We talked about that just very briefly this morning. That's the way of damnation. That's the way of rebellion. That's the way that's going to bring about God's wrath. But you don't have to remain in that state any longer. You can be renewed. You can be saved. And you can be transferred into the kingdom of God's Son and the kingdom of light. You can become a Christian with your sins washed away. If you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, if you're ready to repent of your sins, if you're ready to confess Jesus as the Son of God and the Lord of your life, then you need to choose to be baptized for the remission of your sins. For until you do that, you still remain in your sins. But we would love to help you and assist you this very day to obey the gospel and follow those steps so that you can be added to Christ's kingdom. If you've not done that, we encourage you to do so. Or if there's a Christian here who desires the prayers of the church, we'd be happy to help you as well. So we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.